As we continue our study on the book of Proverbs, let's review where we've reached. In our introduction, we noted that Proverbs is divided by most scholars into nine distinct sections or literary units. Seven of these units possess a superscription or title that is embedded within the ancient text itself and marks the beginning of a new literary unit. The first title is located in chapter 1, verse 1, and begins the book of Proverbs with these words, The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. The first unit includes all the chapters of 1 to 9. The second title embedded in the text is found right before chapter 10, verse 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon. This second unit includes all the Proverbs from chapter 10, verse 1 to chapter 22, verse 16. We have worked our way through the speeches of chapters 1 to 9 and studied various categories of Proverbs. In this lesson, we will turn our attention to the next literary unit of Proverbs. The third unit begins with a title located between verses 16 and 17 of chapter 22. It says simply, Sayings of the Wise. This title marks a unit that includes all the Proverbs between chapter 22, verse 16, and chapter 24, verse 22. It is a short unit encompassing about two chapters. If you look in your Bible, you'll notice following the superscription, there is a renewed invitation to the student or reader to seek and gain wisdom. It is almost a personal note of encouragement. It says, Pay attention and turn your ear to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have them ready on your lips, so that your trust may be in the Lord. I teach you today, even you. Have I not written thirty sayings for you, sayings of counsel and knowledge, teaching you to be honest and to speak the truth, so that you bring back truthful reports to those you serve? The content and style of this introduction to the third unit should sound familiar. It parallels the introductions of the father's speeches to his son in chapters 1 to 9. Its length is similar to the introduction of speech 3, but it contains elements shared by most of the introductions to the speeches. This exhortation clearly marks a change in style and content from the previous section of short proverbs, and it gives scholars reason to identify a new literary unit. The emphasis within the introduction on giving good answers to him who sent the addressee, verse 21, seems to reflect a student's situation where he was sent by his parents. I mentioned in a previous lesson that Proverbs may have been used as a school book or educational tool within a formalized classroom. Some scholars even suggest that Proverbs was used as a tutorial for those who serve in the court of the kings. In this case, Proverbs provided guidelines on how to conduct oneself before the king, how to act responsibly on errands, and to do business with foreign diplomats. There is a curious controversy surrounding chapter 22, verse 20, that has given cause for much speculation. The verse says, Have I not written thirty sayings for you, sayings of counsel and knowledge? Many scholars have studied this literary unit and sought to divide it so that it reflects thirty sayings. The NIV Bible and other translations are printed in such a way as to support this view. Concerning the content of this unit, there are no antithetic proverbs, better proverbs, numerical sayings, or simile proverbs. There is one each of synonymous and admonition proverbs and only three synthetic proverbs. However, this unit does contain seven example stories or longer sayings and 20 of the 34 couplet proverbs found in the entire book. That makes this unit the greatest concentration of couplet proverbs for the entire book. Couplet proverbs use four lines to complete its thought or teaching, rather than the two-line format for the other proverb categories. This makes couplet proverbs appear as two Bible verses instead of the one verse proverb of other categories. Six couplet proverbs, if you remember, are found in speech three of the Father 
and an additional five are found in the next literary unit of Solomon in chapter 25. Thirty-four couplet proverbs make up only 6.2% of the proverbs in this wisdom book. There is a special feature of some of the couplets in this literary unit that I want to point out. Some of the couplet proverbs contain a warning and a reason for the warning. Let's look at a couple of examples. Our first example is found in chapter 22, verses 22 and 23. The couplet proverb says, Do not exploit the poor because they are poor. And do not crush the needy in court. For the Lord will take up their case and will plunder those who plunder them. Notice the reason and warning are contained in the third and fourth lines of the couplet. Another example couplet following the same kind of structure in chapter 23 verses 10 and 11 says, Do not move an ancient boundary stone or encroach on the fields of the fatherless. For their defender is strong. He will take up their case against you. Though the warning and reason are reversed in this one, they still appear in the third and fourth lines of the proverb. Before we study more closely some of the couplet proverbs, I want to go back and look at an interesting characteristic of this section of proverbs. There is much speculation that this literary unit is closely connected to a foreign author of Egyptian wisdom literature. So before we proceed with our study on this unit, we must first move out of the Bible, out of Hebrew culture and literature, and look to the Egyptians. It should not surprise anyone that the Egyptians have a long history of writing and a rich literary genre of instruction or wisdom literature called sebait. Its content has much in common with wisdom literature of other cultures. Many of the earliest sebait claimed to have been written 3,000 years before Christ was born during what the Egyptians called the Old Kingdom period. But scholars generally agree that the Sabaeit were actually composed later in the Middle Kingdom around 1990 to 1050 BC. The fictitious attribution of the writings to authors of an earlier time was intended to give the teachings greater authority. This was a common practice even centuries after Christ. We know about these Sabaeit because most of them are preserved on papyrus scrolls. Two important examples of Sabaeit are preserved in what is currently called the Papyrus Prissy, a 12th Egyptian dynasty scroll dating to about 1990 BC, which is currently in the National Museum in Paris, France. Two other papyrus scrolls containing Sabaeit writings are preserved in the British Museum, and an additional copy is located on the Carnarvon tablet in Cairo, Egypt. The best-known Sabaeit include the complete writings ascribed to Tahotep, the vizier to the 5th dynasty monarch Jedkare Isesi, who ruled from 2388 to 2356 BC. This writing is often called the Teachings of Tahotep, or the Sayings of Good Discourse, from a phrase used in the Sabaeit itself. A second well-known Sabaeit is called the Instructions of Kagemni, attributed to the fourth dynasty of an Egyptian wisdom writer named Hardadef. Only a few pieces of his writing survive to modern times, and nothing is complete. Two Sebait are attributed to Egyptian rulers. The first is the teaching for King Medikare, who lived from 2140 to 2060 BC. The writing claims to have been written by Medikare's father, the preceding monarch. However, most scholars believe the instructions were written at a later period. The other royal teaching is called the Instructions of Amenemopet and attributed to the founder of the 12th dynasty of Egypt about 1950 years before Christ. It was supposedly written as a legacy for a son. Most likely, Amenemopet's writings were composed during the Ramesside period, which most scholars place as 1300 to 1075 B.C., this makes the instructions of Amenemopet older than the Proverbs of the Bible. According to a long history of study dating back to 1888, the instructions of Amenemopet contains 30 chapters of advice for successful living. It is widely regarded as one of the masterpieces of ancient Near Eastern wisdom literature 
and it has been the focus of much study because of its relationship to the book of Proverbs. The instructions of Amenemopet reflect the values that are characteristic of Egypt's age of personal piety. There was a shift away from material success gained through practical action and toward inner peace through patient endurance and passive acceptance of a divine will. The author draws a contrast between two types of men, the silent man, who goes about his business without drawing attention to himself or demanding his rights, and the heated man, who makes a nuisance of himself to everyone and is constantly starting fights with others over matters of no real importance. Contrary to worldly expectation, the author assures his readers that the silent man will ultimately receive divine blessing, while the heated man will inevitably go to destruction. Amenemopet counsels his students to observe modesty, self-control, generosity, and scrupulous honesty, while discouraging pride, impetuosity, self-advancement, fraud, and perjury. The rationale for this way of life is out of respect for Mat, the cosmic Egyptian principle of right order, but also because attempts to gain advantage to the detriment of others within the community brings condemnation, confuses the plans of God, and always leads to disgrace and punishment. It is not surprising that Egyptian wisdom literature influences may be found in Hebrew wisdom literature. Let's look at a timeline to help us understand the timing of Amenemopet compared to the nation of Israel. By using a simple timeline, we can put a reference to Christ and then add our people and events. The oldest Egyptian wisdom literature can be marked as the teachings of Tehotep, giving credit to the time period of 2388 to 2356 BC. However, a more accurate estimation is about 1950 BC. Second, the instructions of Kagemni is credited to 2200 to 2000 BC. It is estimated to have been written about 1700 to 1500 BC. Third, the teaching for King Metakati is credited to 2150 to 2040 BC. Most scholars believe it was written about 1500 to 1300 BC. And the instructions of Amenemopet, credited to the time of 1991 to 1962 BC, is actually estimated to have been written during the Ramesside period of 1300 to 1100 BC. Starting at the other end of the timeline, near the time of Christ, Let's fill in some biblical history. We can plot the general dates. The fall of Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel, was around 586 B.C. The reign of Hezekiah, mentioned in Proverbs 25, verse 1, was between 715 and 686 B.C. The reign of Solomon, mentioned in chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 10, verse 1, was around 970 to 930 B.C. The reign of David was between 1010 and 970 B.C. The reign of Saul roughly covered 1050 to 1010 B.C. Israel's presence in and eventual exodus from Egypt is usually dated between 1440 and 1250 B.C., with many scholars emphasizing a date closer to the 1250 side. Putting these two timelines together, we can see that Israel's exodus from Egypt coincides with the time and influence of the instructions of Amenemopet. This makes a powerful argument that the instructions of Amenemopet could have influenced the third literary unit of the book of Proverbs. Add to this biblical references of Egypt's continued strength and influence during the reigns of Solomon and Hezekiah, and it's easy to conclude that unit three of Proverbs could be connected to Egyptian wisdom literature. Moving beyond the historical connection, let's also compare some content similarities between the instructions of Amenemopet and this literary unit, the Sayings of the Wise, of Proverbs. The first important comparison study between these two texts was conducted by Adolf Ehrman and published in 1924. 
It was his Hebrew textual studies that connected the difficult Hebrew word in chapter 22, verse 20, now translated 30, to the 30 chapters of a minimopet. Look at this similarity. Proverbs chapter 22, 20 now says, Have I not written for you 30 sayings of counsel and knowledge? The instructions of Amenemopet, chapter 30, line 539 says, Look to these 30 chapters. They inform. They educate. Let's compare the content of several passages in the instructions of Amenemopet and unit 3 of the book of Proverbs to show the similarity of thought and teaching. Proverbs chapter 22, verses 17 and 18 says, Pay attention and listen to the sayings of the wise. Apply your heart to what I teach, for it is pleasing when you keep them in your heart and have them ready on your lips. Amenemopet chapter 1 says, Give your ear and hear what I say, and apply your heart to apprehend. It is good for you to place them in your heart. Let them rest in the casket of your belly, that they may act as a peg upon your tongue. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 22 admonishes, Do not exploit the poor because they are poor, and do not crush the needy in court. Amenemopet chapter 2 warns, Beware of robbing the poor and oppressing the afflicted. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 24 and 25 instructs, Do not make friends with a hot-tempered man. Do not associate with one easily angered, for you may learn his ways and get yourself ensnared. Amenemopet chapter 10 teaches, Do not associate with a passionate man or approach him for a conversation. Do not be quick to join with such a one, so that terror does not carry you away. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 29 observes, Do you see this man skilled in his work? He will serve before kings. He will not serve before obscure men. Amenemopet chapter 30 notes, A scribe who is skillful in his business will be found worthy to be a servant in the king's court. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 4 and 5 says, Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Amenemopet chapter 7 teaches, Toil not after riches. If stolen goods are brought to you, They will not remain with you overnight. They have made themselves wings like geese and have flown into the heavens. The common content and themes are stunning even to the skeptics who argue against any connection. Scholarly debate for the last 80 years has built a general consensus that a literary connection between Unit 3 of Proverbs and the instructions of Amenemopet exists. This has influenced many of the study Bibles and several important Bible commentaries. In fact, the Catholic New American Bible has even amended Proverbs chapter 22, verse 19 from, I have made known to you this day, even to you, to read, I make known to you the words of Amenemopet. However, if you've noticed the comparisons between Proverbs and Amenemopet, the two seem to stop around chapter 23, verse 11. What about the other two-thirds or 46 verses of this unit entitled Sayings of the Wise? Because Amenemopet is compared only to the first third of this unit, some scholars argue strongly that unit 3 of Proverbs is not influenced by his writings. They claim the connections are only partial, vaguely similar in subject matter, different in sequence, cover only some of the topics in the Egyptian text, and seem to be unrelated in the final section of chapter 23, verse 11, to chapter 24, verse 22. I believe Amenemopet's writings influenced the sayings of the wise in Proverbs. This doesn't mean Solomon sat down and copied Amenemopet's writings. It doesn't mean the section is intended to be an exact duplicate of Egyptian wisdom literature. What I do believe is that some of the international wisdom of Egypt, valued by Israelites, could have been known and incorporated into this literary unit. If this is true, then the sayings of the wise in Proverbs could be closely associated with foreign collection of wisdom literature. This does not cause a faith problem for me. Rather, it strengthens it. If Solomon set about to compile the most comprehensive book of wisdom for his age, 
then he would wisely choose to include the best international wisdom from the nations surrounding Israel, and especially one of the most powerful nations of his time, Egypt. Such a comprehensive collection of wisdom in Solomon's possession would make him the wisest man of his time. Let's turn our attention briefly to the content of the sayings of the wise. Though this section is divided into 30 sayings by some Bibles, we will divide the material up into three sections based upon the voice or tone of the teacher or parent and the content included. The first section consists of Proverbs between chapter 22, 17 to chapter 23, verse 11, and is most closely associated with the instructions of a menomopet. This section seems to provide instruction for young people planning on a career, possibly within the king's court. Generally, the section can be divided into the following seven topics. The value of wisdom, chapter 22, verses 12 to 21, becomes an encouragement to listen to instruction. Another category is choice of friends, chapter 22, verses 22 to 25, and again, chapter 23, verse 6 to 9, Young people are encouraged to avoid angry, stingy, and foolish companions because of the problems that accompany them. A third category deals with financial entanglements, chapter 22, verses 26 and 27. Specifically, it is a warning not to put up a security for others. The fourth category concerns respect for the law, chapter 22, verse 28, and chapter 23, verses 10 to 11. Youth are warned that God is the ultimate judge in front of whom we all must stand in judgment. A fifth category speaks of the value of hard work, chapter 22, verse 29. Youth are reminded that a skilled worker receives great promotion. A sixth topic encourages self-restraint before authorities, chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. The ability to control oneself in front of rulers and important people is always wise for self-promotion and protection. A seventh topic emphasizes the foolishness of chasing after riches, chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Youth are reminded that riches are not easy to obtain, not reliable, or the highest priority in life. The second section of sayings of the wise deals with the concerns normally associated with youth. The teacher's voice of the first section gives way to the more gentle and affectionate tone of the parent talking to his son. The concerned parent warns youth of the importance of good conduct, wise decisions, and lists some of the temptations that youth encounter. The section divides into five categories as follows. The first is seeking wisdom in developing self-discipline, chapter 23, verses 12 to 16. Here the teacher emphasizes the importance of seeking wisdom and obtaining wisdom through parental discipline. The second topic covers Finding Good Role Models, chapter 23, verses 17 and 18. The parental voice reminds youth that sinners are not worthy of imitating. The third category encourages youth in honoring parents, chapter 23, verses 22 to 25. A wise son will treat his parents properly, to their great delight. The fourth topic emphasizes avoiding sexual temptations, chapter 23, verses 26 to 28. The prostitute is nothing but a deep pit that drains young men of everything they have emotionally, financially, sexually, and spiritually. The fifth and final topic speaks of the dangers of alcohol, chapter 23, verses 19 to 21, and verses 29 to 35. Drinking only leads to poverty and a life of miserable addiction. The longer saying in verses 29 to 35 is the clearest and funniest warning against drinking found in the Old Testament. Its description of the troubles and ailments of a drunkard are based upon laughable but common life observations. The third section of the sayings of the wise returns to the values of wisdom and how it helps the student make wise choices within community. Wisdom's influence encourages the student to uphold the cause of the weak, treat everyone fairly, and behave as a good citizen. This section divides into the following categories. The first contrasts the wicked and the wise, chapter 24, verses 1 to 9. Wickedness brings violence and trouble, while wisdom brings wealth, power, 
and victory. The second lesson for youth is valuing wisdom, chapter 24, verses 3 to 7, and also verses 13 and 14. Wisdom silences the fool and brings sweetness and hope to the soul. The third category emphasizes supporting social justice, chapter 24, verses 10 to 12. A wise man gains strength to stand up for the oppressed rather than turning a blind eye to them. He knows his maker will provide justice according to what each has done. The fourth topic concerns treating neighbors and enemies fairly, chapter 24, verses 15 to 18. Wisdom seeks no evil against neighbors and shows compassion even for enemies. The fifth value for youth includes not envying the wicked, chapter 24, verses 19 to 20. A wise man is not envious of the wicked and what they have now, for he knows their future and the ruin that awaits them. And finally, the last lesson for youth is honoring the Lord in King, chapter 24, verses 21 and 22. A wise man shows respect for those in authority. There is frequent mention of kings and court service throughout the entire literary unit. This enhances the idea that young people, beginning their careers, are the target audience for this instruction. Before ending this study, I think it would be great to select two specific instructions and break them down. This would help us to learn how to study each proverb within this unit. First, let's read a longer saying found in chapter 23, verses 6 to 8. Do not eat the food of a stingy man. Do not crave his delicacies, for he is the kind of man who is always thinking about the cost. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. You will vomit up the little you have eaten and will have wasted your compliments. The Hebrew uses the phrase evil of eye, which is correctly translated as stingy man. In this proverb, the emphasis is less on evil and more on being greatly concerned with what happens to his possessions. The primary teaching of this proverb instructs young men to be careful of the spoken words of people. The greedy and stingy may profess themselves to be benevolent and generous, but inwardly they are not. They may even place a great amount of food before you in an effort to display their kindness and generosity, but they are inwardly concerned with how much you eat. The instruction is to be careful and not always take at face value the words spoken by individuals. They may say and act one way, but really mean the opposite inwardly. The secondary teaching of this proverb concerns the use of praise. In the case of visiting a stingy man, the wise young man is instructed to be careful, eat little, and do not heap up praises upon the host, probably an important person within the community. Any praises concerning generosity are wasted, and eating much will only create problems in the relationship. The phrase, vomiting up the little you have, enforces the idea that one cannot keep ill-gotten gains. Eating too much or taking from a stingy man would be unwise. Whatever you gain in eating, you lose in relationship. It is like losing or vomiting up the food you have eaten. This proverb follows closely the instructions given to the one who sits at the king's table or at a meal with the rich and powerful in chapter 23, verses 1 to 3. Do not abandon yourself to eating as much as you want. Eat little and show self-control. Others will watch what you eat and take note of it. The wise man will observe and measure the kind of men he eats with and act accordingly so as not to give offense or strain the relationships. Let's look at a couplet proverb found in chapter 23, verses 13 and 14. It reads, Do not withhold discipline from a child. If you punish him with the rod, he will not die. Punish him with the rod and save his soul from death. There is an assumption upon which this proverb rests. This proverb suggests youth will not listen, not often, to the advice of their parents or older people. They will rebel or refuse instruction. The parent then must decide what to do with a rebellious child, correct him or leave him alone. This proverb considers the consequences of both decisions. Punishment is not seen as mean-spirited or excessive. 
punishment is meant in this proverb to be correctional. Emphasis for punishment is the well-being of the child, not the attitude of the parent. In fact, it is wise for the parent to make sure he or she does not act out of anger or frustration when disciplining. Parents should consider the amount and length of punishment in line with the offense. This way, even the child can see the fairness of the punishment. It should be instructional for the purpose of developing wisdom, good habits, and character. Excessive punishment or correction given in anger will most likely undermine the corrective spirit of the exercise and may even bring about negative results. A child who is abused, excessively punished, or mistreated when a parent is angry will likely become offended, hurt, rebellious, or even emotionally scarred. In these verses, punishment with a rod is described. A similar proverb about discipline is found in chapter 22, verse 15. That proverb says, Folly is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of discipline will drive it far away. The rod, in Hebrew, actually refers to a flail, a stick used to separate beans from their husks. The idea of corrective punishment is to separate the folly from the heart of a child. A flail does not need anger. It needs steady, methodical strokes, not too hard to destroy the beans, but enough to separate. Additionally, not all punishment needs a rod of correction. Withholding privileges, money, or opportunities to visit friends, or restricting the movements of a child are all possible forms of correction. Not every offense needs physical punishment. However, this proverb does seem to support the idea that some physical punishment can be applied, as long as it's given in the spirit of love and correction for the purpose of teaching, and that it fits the offense. In fact, the proverb suggests the rod will not kill the child, so do not be timid in its use. The use of the rod in punishment for correction of bad behavior may actually save the child from a life of sinful rebellion and crime. In a sense, the rod may even save the child's soul from a spiritual death. This proverb parallels another ancient writing found in the sayings of an Assyrian sage known as Ahikar, some 700 years after Solomon and 200 years before Christ. Ahikar instructs, If I beat you, my son, you will not die, but if I leave you alone, you will not live. A blow for the serving boy, a rebuke for the slave girl, and for all your servants, discipline. It would be fun to study every couplet proverb in the sayings of the wise and dig out the multiple levels of meaning. However, we are out of time for this lesson. Thank you for listening. I hope you are learning much about one of the greatest books of wisdom. Until next time.